Hi guys, Coach Alex from Fast Fitness Tips. We're here to talk about riding short hills today. And what I'm gonna do is break the hill down into strategic components so that you can attack each one um, with the optimum strategy. And the way I'm gonna do it is I'm gonna say we've got the initial phase, phase one, which is the initial rise. We've got the middle phase, the main drag of the hill, if you like, which is phase two. And then we've got the summit or cresting phase, phase three. Now we do have the descent as well. We'll talk about that more in another future video. So that's how we're gonna break it down logically. And we're gonna do it with my little friend here, uh, Mr. Wooden Cyclist. Now there's a big difference between attacking these phases as a beginner and attacking these phases as a competent rider. You don't need to be a pro with four or 500 watts to attack a hill competently. You just have to attack it strategically. Now the strategic element starts with how you approach the hill at the beginning. So let's have a think about that. So we've got the initial slope, we've got the main rise, and then we've got the crest. Okay? Now, in an ideal attack for a sure hill, the middle slope effectively doesn't exist. In other words, you attack the hill as if it's just an initial rise and a crest. The way that works is you have enough initial speed that the initial increase in speed gets you up to the point where the crest is beginning. The crest is that point where the hill's gradient is decreasing. You know, if the hill is, for example, you know, 6%, then the crest is 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0%. So let's consider how to attack that initial slope then from flat to, a, you know, a gentle or moderate rise. Now the key here is actually to build up momentum. The key here, the phrase I want you to bear in mind is to attack, is to attack that initial gradient. If you attack that initial gradient with increased speed, it's quite possible that your increased speed will scrub off only at the point where the crest of the hill is within sight or where the crest of the hill is manageable for you to increase your power slightly so that you can accelerate away over the top of that hill. So the question is, can we use science to predict what increase in speed will get us up this hill? Well, in fact, we can, and it's pretty easy. Let me just demonstrate this. The energy by which you're going along is actually represented by not your momentum, which would be m times v. It's actually represented by your um, kinetic energy. And that's the old equation from physics, if you remember, of half mass times velocity squared. So this represents the kinetic energy of the cyclist. And we know that going uphill, you convert that kinetic energy into potential energy. And the potential energy is given by the formula mass times a gravitational constant times the height, the height gained. Now this is actually very useful because we can work out very simply what um, conversion is there from the, from the kinetic energy, essentially the cyclist's velocity squared, into the height of the hill. Now to make that easier, we just have to rearrange that equation. So cancel out the mass from each side, and then times, what do we have there? Half V squared equals GH, times by two on each side, V squared equals two GH, and then square root each side, velocity equals the square root of two GH. Or if we want to find um, the height, we can reverse it. H equals um, V squared over 2G. In fact, that's velocity in meters per second. So to convert that into kilometers per hour, put in a constant, which will be 12.96 into there. Okay, that's the conversion factor. That would be actually uh, 3.6 squared on the bottom. So now using that equation, we can easily work out what the conversion rate from the cyclist speed is into elevation gained. And let's just have a quick look at that. Let's assume the cyclists are going along at 50 kph. That's your acceleration along the flat to attack that hill, okay? You go up to 50 kph from your normal speed of 30 kph. And you allow the slope to drag you back, as it were, from 50 to 30 kph. In other words, you lose 20 kph. So the slope retards you by 20 kph. Well, if you plug that into the equation 
uh, losing 20 kph is equivalent to gaining about 1.6 meters in height. Now that might not sound very much, but that's actually the equivalent of a 3% gradient slope over 50 meters. So what I'm saying then is by accelerating up to from 30 kph on the flat to 50 kph approaching the hill, you gain enough kinetic energy to transfer into the potential energy or the climb, to put it in simple terms, of around about 1.6 meters. You get effectively 1.6 meters of free 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 climb and so if the hill was only a um, three percent hill over 50 meters that would take you to the top of the hill and in reality in cycling you don't need to be at the top of the hill you just need to be in phase three in phase three near the crest of the hill okay if you can be within sight of the crest of the hill then you can power over the hill and continue away with good speed let's look at another example um, your normal speed let's say is 25 kph and you accelerate to 50 kph. So on this occasion, you increase your kinetic energy by the equivalent of 25 kph. If you plug that into the equation, then that works out at 2.5 meters of potential energy. In other words, 2.5 meters of free climbing because of your attack speed. 2.5 meters, which is the equivalent, of course, of a 5% of a hill, which is 50 meters long. So by, going, uh, by increasing your speed from 25 kph up to 50 on that uh, phase one, the, basically the initial slope, you can probably get over a 50 meter climb with a 5% gradient. Now, of course, if the climb is extremely long, you've got to be careful about that strategy. Basically, the longer this phase two, the longer the maintenance or equilibrium phase, the less you really have to attack the slope because the equilibrium phase will be stretched out for a long time and the increase in um, speed or the increase in height you get from that attack phase will be relatively modest and you're potentially going to be burning too many matches to go for or to put all your effort in to that initial slope so this strategy of attacking hard works better with very short hills the shorter the better hills where that equilibrium phase is only let's say 50 100 200 meters now if the climb is very long you go into an equilibrium phase you go into an equilibrium phase whereby you have to choose the amount of power that you can sustain for the length of that hill. And I've previously covered that on a previous video here. So check that out for the answer to how to match your power to the length of the hill in terms of the equilibrium phase. But what I do want to tell you about the equilibrium phase today is try not to be scared about the grade of the hill. For example, consider a raw beginner trying to maintain 20 kph. Let's say you're trying to maintain 20 kph and you're a raw beginner with 150 watts. 150 watt rider, if that's their sustainable, let's say, FTP or hill climbing FTP, then the beginner can climb a 2% a grade at 150 watts, maintaining 20 kph. Now here I'm considering an 80 kilogram rider and bike combined with a rolling resistance of 0 0.004 and a CDA of 0.32 one approximately. So if we take that rider and now say what would a 200 watt um, near beginner, let's call it an improver sustain, well an improver with 200 watts could sustain a hill of 3.3% compared to the beginner's 2.1% maintaining that same speed of 20 kph. So what I'm doing here is I'm asking by increasing the watts, what, what increasing grade in hill is possible for a speed of 20 kph, a speed which is quite a decent hill climb speed. So at 150 watts, we've got 2.1%. 200 watts for the improver, we've got 3.3%. For the decent club cyclist, 250 watts, we've got 4.4%. So a club cyclist going at 250 watts can manage a hill of 4.4%. The same as a beginner can manage a hill of 2.1%. A decent rider of 300 watts could manage 5.5%. You know, a superior rider of 350 watts could manage 6.6%. Outstanding rider with 400 watts could manage 7.7%. So just imagine, if you're that rider who can output 400 watts on that hill, your equivalent hill climb for 20 kph is 7.7% grade, whereas the raw beginner's is a 2.1% grade. So if the raw beginner is afraid of a 2.1% slight incline, you should be equivalently afraid only of a 7.7% quite steep hill. Now let's, let's change the figure somewhat and say the rider wants to sustain 30 kph rather than 20 kph. Well the raw beginner can only sustain, as it happens, 30 kph at zero. So their, their 30 kph is at zero. If you're the 200 watt rider, you can sustain 30 kph at 
under 1%, a 0.75 gradient. Remember, that's an 80 kilogram rider and bike. You can model this yourself, by the way, on computationalcyclist.com. Um, so that's an 80 kilogram rider and bike with the CDA, remember, of 0.32 and the CRR of 0.004. So the 200 watt rider is going up less than 1% to maintain th 30 kph. So what's the, what's the equivalent grade to maintain 30 kph at 250 watts? Is 1.5% a slight slope. At 300 watts, 2.3%. At 350 watts, 3%. At 400 watts, 3.8%. 450 watts, 4.5%. And at 500 watts, 5.3%. So if you really want to go up a hill fast, and let's be honest, uh, going up a hill at uh, 30 kph is really fast, then what I'm saying is for a, an improver rider of 200 watts, they're approaching a slight slope of 0.75 as sustainable at 30 kph, whereas the pro rider is able to ride up a 5% significant hill at 30 kph. So my point in saying of all of this is that the degree of difficulty is heavily related to your power and that's determined by basically what's going on in that equilibrium phase. So don't be afraid of the hill, particularly if you're an improved or more powerful rider. Just think what you can do compared to the beginner basically. Okay, let's consider phase three now, which is um, what happens at the crest of the hill. So you're in that equilibrium phase and then you're in the crest of the hill and then you're in the descent. plus four grade, and then that's, that's minus one, minus two. Well, the mistake, the, the mistake that most riders, most beginners make here, I should say, is that they're running out of energy rapidly in the ascent, and when they're anywhere near the top, they start uh, conserving energy, either slackening, slackening off their effort, the watts are dropping, and the bike is still slowing on that ascent on the plus two and plus one grade until they get to the top when they virtually come to a stop. Or even worse, they see the crest from a long way off and they basically come to a near stop at around, you know, plus four, plus three percent rise. But then they finally see the top of the hill and then they start accelerating again, like at plus three, plus two, plus one. Well, that's enormously energy inefficient. I'll provide you a link for that there. Basically, in the climb, try never to give big surges. Try never to really give big acceleration. No, the optimum strategy for a good rider is to pick up speed as you can um, rise to that crest because picking up speed becomes progressively easier when the gradient falls to plus two, plus one and zero. So if you're here, for example, and you can see, you can see the crest, that's a really good time to start increasing your effort again just as you're coming to about the gradients falling in severity to plus two or plus one. So I would suggest you start raising your effort to kind of a, your threshold. So if you're at like FTP, 20, CP20 um, type of effort, then you raise it to um, FTP minus about 20% at about plus two. And the same, about, the same at around um, plus one, which will mean you start accelerating again up to zero. Hold that, hold that power. Obviously your power here is going to be at uh, maximum, let's say FTP, uh, maximum there and plus you know 20 percent on FTP on that rise so your power is falling but falling gradually and you don't let the speed diminish too rapidly on the climb so that when you get to uh, the top of the climb you're still maintaining your speed in fact at plus one and plus zero you actually start accelerating you start accelerating past the crest and then enter the descent so you have an effect what I think of as the marble effect which is if you um, imagine setting a marble rolling down a slope, you know, it shoots off and then you put another marble going the same speed a few seconds later down the same slope. Obviously, it goes the same speed. But at the bottom, the distance between those two marbles is very considerable. The distance is very considerable, which is why it helps a lot to get going as soon as possible as you uh, go over that crest. Now, the beginner makes a couple of mistakes, like I said. One, they enter and exit the crest too slow. And secondly, they have done it delayed just because of the difference in strategy. And I'll show you what difference the strategy makes using well, the model of a hill where we go from plus six to zero and then minus two and look at the power across each of these hill phases and see what happens in terms of the relative speed. I'll show you that now. Now, one more interesting thing about the descent. Remember our equation for kinetic energy? Well, if we reverse it, MGH, which is our potential energy side, and our half and our half MV squared, which is our kinetic energy side, 
It's exactly the same on the way down, but this time your potential energy is getting converted into kinetic energy. And as we did before, if we just solve that equation, it's very easy to show that a descent of, let's say, 10 meters, it doesn't really matter what the distance there is, let's say it's a 10% uh, decline, average, 10% decline on average, but the key thing is 10 meters. A 10 meter fall will actually be the equivalent of an increase in speed of 50 kph. And as we saw earlier, 2.5 meter fall would be the equivalent of 25 kph. So what I'm saying there is if the descent encompasses a 10 meter fall, you can increase the speed of the bike just because of the conversion of potential to kinetic energy um, up to 50 kPa. Now, of course, that's not the end of the story because that's assuming a frictionless system. And in reality, the rider is retarded by friction, rolling resistance, and of course, wind resistance. However, you can still see the potential energy gain from that fall is converted into the rider's acceleration, which is a tremendous asset. The dynamics of riding solo, which is basically the discussion here as compared to the pack on the descent is slightly different. Generally, when you're riding the pack, the advantage is basically to stay in the pack because you're getting um, enhanced shelter, of course, from the wind stroke air resistance. And secondly, you may ride a little bit more conservatively in the pack because you have to allow the rider in front to take the corner. So you have to be careful with your braking not to run into the rider in front when they're taking those um, hairpin curves. But this whole picture then of correctly traversing a hill and getting going after the crest was beautifully illustrated this year in the tour okay, but with so here's uh, Chris Froome's really amazing breakaway right to the finish Dude, where he won the stage. Of cycling, the you should know that when you uh, come across the top of a hill uh, or the top of a that's, that's not where you stop. You don't stop at the top. You just keep going. Most people are going to know that that's actually where it gets super hard is right over the top. Chris Froome starts drilling it just like you're supposed to. And then Quintana, what are you doing, bro? He's pulling off to like let other guys chase. So you can see right here, you've got all these guys, no Moistar at all here. There's just everyone in this little group has no need to chase. You can see it from a different angle. Quintana, for whatever reason, just deciding I don't think that I'm going to chase. And by the time he takes a drink of his bottled water, the dude's gone. Chris so this is an example of actually using the correct strategy the wind. at the crest, but again, converting it into a good downhill tactic so that your breakaway leads to the finish. And it works beautifully where the descent of the hill actually ends on the finish line rather than, you know, more ascents before that actual finish where the bunch will tend to catch up. So let's summarize, guys. Okay guys, so what I'm saying is if you ride phase one, phase two, and phase three of hills strategically, then you can be the best rider that you can be on hills. You can approach a hill thinking, I can do better on this, I can be an improver, I can be a good hill rider rather than a beginner. That's what I'm after. I'm just trying to get you to be the best rider you can on hills. And for short hills, in my opinion, this is the way to do it. Thanks for watching guys. Take care.